Hi, before we start the film, I will let you know I will be at Twin Cities Con this year, November 11th, 12th, and 13th. I'll be selling my comics and artworks, and I have a table. So come see me at Twin Cities Con. Um, we'll put the link down below so you can get your tickets early. There is a discount for that as well. Mm -hmm. It's at the Minneapolis Convention Center. We love to talk to fans. Um, we love to see support of the show. So come see me at Twin Cities Con, November 11th, 12th, and 13th. Oh. Now for the episode. Today, Nick, we're going to talk yeah. about not the two vampire films that Neil Jordan made. No. We're going to talk about the other monster movie that he made, and one that I think doesn't get talked about very much. No, I never heard, I did, never knew this movie existed, really. I yeah. mean, I've, I've seen Neil Jordan's IMDb. I just, it's one of those like, oh, yeah. It's, I've it's never watched This is my first time seeing this. So, <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, today we're going to talk Neil Jordan's, I think it's maybe second or third feature film. Right, yeah. yeah the Company of Wolves. Welcome back to the show. I'm one of your hosts, Kyle Gothi from GoatFilmReviews.com. Hi, everybody. I'm Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast. Thanks for finding us. Thanks for watching and for our loyal fans. Thank you for continued support of the show. You can follow the show on Twitter and on Instagram. We do have a Patreon. Check that out for some great deals to tell some movies we will be reviewing for upcoming videos. Uh, both Kyle and I are members of the Minnesota Film Critics Alliance. Check out that webpage for critics reviews as well as ours. And today we're going to talk about another Werewolf movie from the early 80s. We love werewolf movies <laughs> of the early 80s. It is Company of Wolves. Yeah, so Rosaline's sister is dead, killed by something vicious, and she spends a lot of time with Granny in the forest, yeah. who feeds her head with stories of big, bad werewolves. The forest is a dangerous place, of course, and Rosaline meets a man one day who is not exactly what he seems, and she must trust in Granny's lessons in order to stay alive. Okay, there's not a really a lot much we can do about well, background, mm -hmm. other than this is kind of lifted from your typical fairy tale stories, and it's projected as kind of a very, very fairy tale kind of a film. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, I don't know, you'll find it in a horror category. Would you find it more or less, it kind of is horror, but there are horror elements. I would love an open debate. I mean, if you put in the comments if you think there's a horror or not. I, yeah. I kind of... Some scenes are, some scenes aren't. Genre yeah. is such a cosmic gumbo nowadays yeah. where it's just like, when you really like dive into it, every film seems to have... I've always made the argument every film is horror because every film has one scene in it that is going to shock even romances. There's yeah. some element of terror to it. Yeah. Um, you know, this this film is based, of course, on the, the, the tale of Little Red Riding Hood, right. but then also uh, a story written by co-screenwriter Angela Carter called The Company of Wolves that was from The Bloody Chamber which was a collection of stories that she'd done as well. So we've got that mixed with the idea of this. And what's funny, too, is it almost ends up being a anthology in some ways, in that we've got these little three stories different about parts. werewolves yeah. that are each about a lesson, about, you know, trusting someone around you, never take a bite, you know, all these yeah. kind of elements of, like, basically training Rosaline, or Rosaline to avoid the danger that she ends up facing, which is a smart way to go about it because we all know the story of Little Red Riding Hood, so it's kind of how you tell the story at this point, how you preface it, and how you use horror and fantasy to your ways. But it is a little bit of a, uh, so like background. This is Neil Jordan, uh, right? We talked about his second film. Mm -hmm. um, he would go on to do a little more less, um, I would say, mystical movies, like I would say The Crying Game, mm -hmm. uh, which he's very famous for. Um, Neil Jordan loves the temperament of try to get it as much of a reality, even though it's not reality. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's a studio set built. Yeah, and that's Neil Jordan's aesthetic is try to convince you that this is actually almost like a documentary, even though you know it's fake. Yeah, a documentary style because he puts live animals in there. Even putting like live animals, like almost gonna get run over. Right? Yeah, yeah, well, he's got that. You know, I think that they were they were Belgian Shepherd dogs that were painted, <laughs> so yeah. that because they couldn't get a wolf to do the role. Um, There's a little possums you know, down the road that only get railed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think I'd read somewhere that there was twelve trees used in production. That's all they could afford. So they just had to rearrange the trees yeah, more around the area. Right. Um, there's a frog down it. in the... Bar they're burying somebody. There's a frog down there. For yeah. Some <laughs> I think maybe the most expensive prop in the entire film is the devil's car. Right. So <laughs> There are really wolves in here. Uh, in, I'll get to my review. There's a necessity. I think the title fits periphery wise called Company Rule Wolves rather than A Pack of Wolves. Mm -hmm. I think there's going to be something a little more tangible we can talk about in the review. But overall background, if you didn't know Neil Jordan, Neil Jordan's signature for filmmaking is the duration of film lasts a little bit longer than it should. Mm. That's kind of my signature. Like Neil Jordan 
Try to stretch his out a little bit longer than it feels, but that's his nature. That's what he does. That's his kind of his aesthetic. Yeah. Sometimes it seems last a little longer than it really should. Well, that's kind of yeah. yeah there's there's a stretching Which out of we're not out of the woods yet, and I don't mean yeah. that as a pun for the film, but like yeah. just in general, gotta get it in there. His stories yeah. do seem to have that length to them where they feel like odysseys. You know, and primarily when you look at this film or even his other fantasy films like uh, like Interview with a Vampire, but even just one of his more recent films, he did a horror film called Greta that I think has three false endings to it where I thought the film was going to be done yes. and then it introduces another twist to it that goes, oh God, it's not done yet. You know, and I think Greta is a great up, usage yeah. of that where like the, the pitfalls, the trap doors only lead to more traps instead of to an, an ending, good or bad. Right, because you could take like certain scenes where like the second act should end and you're like maybe that should end the movie there but no we're going to continue on yeah there's certain certain parts where i'm interviewing the vampire you're like that's a good time to end it but we're going to continue on and that's i think there's some things where a lot of film fewer feel fans get upset with neil jordan is the duration of movies where it's like oh god we have to start all over this process again mm. and that's kind of a signature thing um so yeah interview with the vampire um so he's not he's comfortable doing the mysticism but he also takes himself out of that as well yeah yeah yeah, and that, that length is kind of interesting because when you look at this film we've got the tale of the two husbands, the transformation potion, the wedding and the, and the spurned lover, um, and, and the, the woman, the she-wolf out yep. in the wild. Each one of those is its own story, and each one of those, again, goes a little bit further past the ending. So you've yep. got the extended length of what he usually does in a narrative feature, but you also have that with four in, internal features that he's telling as well. So we really have five extended endings in a 95-minute movie that just, I felt... Mm. Uh, it goes to so many different directions, and each one has its own style too. Yeah, I love that about that is that each film has its own style within the narrative. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much a signature for Neil Jordan. Mm -hmm. It's like which character should we focus on? So maybe you could do this by this point of view. Like sometimes it does both, whereas the subplots are sometimes more dominant than the main plot. Yeah. Uh, in this movie, you have David Warner. Love it. Yeah. He doesn't, get, <laughs> he doesn't do much, but he of course he does more with what he very little he has in this movie. Yeah. I mean, um, he's a standout in a Ninja yeah. Turtles movie for crying out loud. The man knows how to stand out. Okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then surprisingly, I mean, we mentioned that before. Angela Lansbury is the grandmother yeah. who does awesome how you speak the lines through. That some of it will seem hokey, but she sells it so very well. Mm -hmm. Like she bites an apple. Like I told you. Yes. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, t I yeah. told you, but I really will tell you later. Um, yeah, yeah, Angela Lansbury, we decided on this film, I think, before I remembered that she was in it. Um, and, of course, she passed recently. But And so many people will look at her career and they'll say, Murder, She Wrote, which was during its second yeah. season filming when this was made. Uh, and you also have a lot of younger people, my wife Disney included, movies who go yeah. Beauty and the Beast. But then we also have this film as well. And Ben Knobs and Broomsticks for me. Yeah. But, right, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so yeah, then you have Stephen Ray who loves to, I think, not only challenge himself, I think it's a perfect fit for him to be in a Neil Jordan movie. And I'm going to cite The Crying Game also. Mm. But Stephen Ray's also take chances and risks. Not to mention he takes off his clothes. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if you really want to sell this to kids, really. But No, yeah, yeah. I, I would say, you know, Even those are and kids, such, it's pretty bloody. It's a little yeah. bit bloody, too. There's a decapitation of a particular uh, murder she wrote writer. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> there's some pretty bloody stuff in the film. You know, Stephen Ray as well, I think, he's probably the most frequent collaborator with Neil Jordan because you also have him showing up with Interview with the Vampire. You also have even the, the aforementioned Greta, he's in that film as well. So oh, yeah. he is he has yeah. pervaded a lot of Jordan films in small roles such as this as well, where he's not he's usually not the main guy. Crying Game, I think, you know, excluded, but he's yeah. usually not the main guy in the film. Uh, which is always kind of fascinating because when he pops up he's that extra splash. And I think that's the right way to view Stephen Ray is that he adds a lot of character to a film. Right. Even one that might be middling. I think he's my favorite part when he plays a werewolf again in Underworld Four. So <laughs> <laughs> that as well. Uh, so we have for cinematography, I think is another one that collaborated a lot with Neil Jordan. Yeah, Brian Loftus. Yeah, right, Brian Loftus. Um, so what they, they usually do is they pretty usually don't have a steady cam unless the steady cam is important for what the action is. Mm -hmm. Usually, they just set the camera like this for something that's really important. But a lot of times, you have very fast cuts and a little awkward angles, mm -hmm. make it a little more compact than it really kind of is. Of course, you're doing it in a sound studio. So you have a yeah. little more compact to this movie. It's a little more compressed, the environment. There's really not a lot of space here branching out. I would say like the um, the donkey movie that we taught. We, we teach. Oh, Donkey Skin, yeah. Donkey Skin has a lot of compressing of it, even though their scope is far back. Yeah, and you can never tell with these kinds of films, because even though they are studio films, we're not sure where these sets came from. We're not sure where like all the elements came from. Were they able to carve a doorway in for the camera to fit, or did they have to gorilla 
fit inside of a preconceived yeah. set. Um, that happens sometimes where you're like the, the person is like, I'm borrowing a set, I can't destroy it, so I have to use it in a certain way. This, you know, because there's a classical fairy tale aspect to the film where you almost want, wonder if these elements were then reused and, and you know configured later on as well. No, there's intentional for the you know because it's a fairy tale, so you have a lot of the younger people in the movie, the the, the women are very big eyed, mm -hmm. almost like you draw, how you dry in a children's book where the eye, well, the eyes are super big. Oh yeah, and I think that's intentionally casting part of it too, mm -hmm. right? We also uh, we also have Sarah Patterson who is cast in the re lead role of Rosaline, uh, underage actress. The role was written for someone over eighteen so that the film could be more seductive, more sexual, and then. He basically he like saw her. She did a great job in the role, but he was like, I, I can't give this role to someone who's underage, like the the way it is right now. Yeah. And so he kept looking, keeping her in like his idea mind of like someone who's like her but older. Uh, and then eventually landed on the fact I can't find someone who can do the role better, so I will adjust the role to fit the actress, makes sense. which is a dangerous thing to do. In I some know, ways but it makes because yeah, yeah, no, you know your actors and characters need to fit your story. But no, 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 no. if you only find the best person, and she happens to be underage, you remove some of the elements and make it a more palatable film. So. I didn't do a lot of research, but I think if the exterior shots were supposed to be, if you watch the movie, what's supposed to be reality of them going to that house and everything, it looks like it's a different camera than what they use for a studio. Mm -hmm. A different lighting aspect. So it's mm -hmm. a, they're very divorced separation of what she's dreaming to the dream world and outside their dream world. Yeah. 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 There's very a lot of whimsical for this movie. So. Yeah. Especially when you look at the, the Chinese box structure of the film, too, with this opening that happens yeah. to be her dreaming in her home. Her father is there, her sister is there, her mother is there. You know, it's a Wizard of Oz-like opening to the film, and we keep returning to the fact that she's dreaming. Another very interesting choice. I won't say whether or not it worked until we get to the, the end of our episode here, but uh, the but Chinese box structure is very unusual for it. Perfect time to now kind of give out our review yeah. of Company Volts. So I think if you are a fan of Neil Jordan, Specifically, if you like his style aesthetic, it's nice to see this start before he gets it into the 90s. Yeah. Yeah. You see a lot of it, like what you would see eventually, what I've already talked about before, the durations of cuts. Almost seems like there's three different films in a film. Yeah. It's uh, jam-packed with story. It's jam-packed <laughs> with story, but also it's centered on, everything's not really centered, but everything's always off kilter a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this so. this idea that we open with the the Chinese box structure, I don't think works entirely all that well. And it was a choice made by him after the fact to add it in. I don't think it adds much to the narrative. I think it'd be cleaner without. But to have that and then jumpstart into our wooded area behind our home, where we have basically like the the epitome of the dream taking place, right. yeah. uh, is is an interesting way to kind of use that because then you also have this idea of the the devil showing up in one of the stories inside of a fancy vehicle. Uh, which would not have happened in that way. <laughs> but, you know, there's that dreamlike narrative where she's adding things from her real life into the story, um, which is peculiar. Um, yeah. I think that element works better within the narrative than it does within the framing device. I agree. I, if you're going to be a casual film watcher, this movie might be a little more tedious than you like to digest. Mm -hmm. And you might get impatient. You might be get bored with it after, the, like, the first hour and 30 minutes and, like, we're going to continue on. And that's kind of Neil Jordan's aesthetic. He's, he's just comfortable doing that way. But I'm just going to forewarn you. You might, if you're just a casual, if you're not a film critic, you're not obsessed with films and stuff like that, you might get bored with this. Yeah. I think bit. part of it is that we, we go into this movie, 95 minutes. We start with a very, again, like, we know where this movie's ending up. Right. It's very obvious we're going to a red ride. But even the music situation. has a certain pacing to it. There's no intense buildup to the music. Yeah. yeah. But if we know the end game and we don't know anything that happens before that, so we open in present day and then kind of like convolute ourselves through the story, it's almost like as viewers, if you are not embracing the journey, you will have str you will trouble have trouble. If you're only in watching the movie for the ending, it will not work for you because right. the journey itself moves through so many different paths in getting to a understood ending. We know where it's going to end up. We don't know how we're going to get there. And that's maybe the most fascinating part for me is, of course, I wanted to see which elements of which stories were actually going to matter. Yeah. Because as the narrative went on, I didn't know that they would matter. And it was important to me at the end of the film to have all that coalesce into one, make a more fantastic ending. So, And then you know, Neil Jordan likes to play in the balance of a little more, we talked about a spectrum of films are centered into the twilight area of dreaming and reality. Mm -hmm. But Neil likes to bend and lean a little more over to the dream reality. He likes yeah. to make more, a little more dreams, even far of the needle to like David Lynch. Mm -hmm. Make it as dreamy like as quality, so you're immense with it. So, But then he has to kind of balance his center 
of reality, but when he does, it seems what, the duration is still kind of kind of takes you lost out of it. But you can see that with with this film is that it's almost like Jordan is kind of searching for what works best in the film. Yeah. This is a yeah. very early career work for him. It's a very ambitious movie. It's one of the most ambitious movies I think he has ever. No, made. I'm surprised with how long it is for somebody's first movie. Like how much yeah. you have to digest in there. He's there's a lot of stuff packed in there, and to trust in again a younger actress who had to have shorter schedules and work around schooling in order to have her as your lead. Um, and then you have the, you know, someone who's Angela Lansbury was a, was a practical legend at this point in right. the 80s, but still like not on the level that maybe we even see today is that she was still very popular, but she's also kind of the secondary character. She's almost our narrator in some ways because she is narrating all these stories. Um, and then to put David Warner, I think it's a nice thing to have when you have Sarah surrounded by solid performers who can help elevate her as a young actress, make her performance even better. Yeah. I think that helps out a lot. So your primary focus is, I think, the metaphorical, the beasts within men can be external, but then inside they can be human. You want to balance this, all this beauty and beast stuff, and women should watch out for who they should marry. It's a very fair tale of story. Mm -hmm. uh, they may look like grotesque from the outside, but inside they're softy. Or it might be the other way around. You know? Yeah. <laughs> or they might be somebody that you think is going to be your friend, and all of a sudden it turns on to be your villain. So you always have to keep your uh, radar up when you're searching for men or out in the woods. And it's almost like this forewarning for all females when you're searching around or being yourself that you have to be on guard the entire time. Yeah. Even when you're eating an apple. Well, and it's true, too, because as she is growing older in this role, she's developing into a woman. And yeah. so to have her doing that, and she sheds her more... Uh, you know, tonally soft clothing into this red riding outfit. You know, it's very like, yeah. you know, very indicative of like who she's becoming and how she is embracing her female, her, her female agency. And then also everyone around her, it seems, is focused on she's becoming a woman. Now she can be ours. You know, yeah. and there's that kind of like lusty anger to a lot of the men. I think that's where it's really clever to have David Warner's character involved in some of the scenes is that we get to see uh, a, a welcome male presence who is a good father who protects yeah. his children who's already lost one child and so now he knows the pain of it so he's overprotective of her it's kind of that way where even he has this kind of like control over who she is but it's out of love whereas the other ones are all control yeah. out of lust so right uh, the, the viewpoint only men can be wolves Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a female werewolf in this. But only those, in her story at the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always the males, and it's always a threat of every stage of womanhood, from being a girl to women to being a wife or even a grand, even an older lady. Always going to be after you on guard to watch out for these things Yeah. in the forest. And they can be very blunt, egregious, or very sly. Either way, they'll find some way to get into your life. Yeah. But that's where I think that last story is really important that Sarah, or that Rosalina is telling. Um, is you know is about the she wolf. It's about the fact that in order to almost survive in general society as an adult, is you have to have a little bit of ferocity to yourself too. Right. Not just from the male perspective, but from the female perspective too. If only in defense, but sometimes you know to to you know to be able to survive in that way. So. Right. And every core of the werewolf lore is people embracing their animalistic traits that they're leaving behind to be civil, not to be human, but to finally go with your id of being an animal mm -hmm. and that's the whole enticement of werewolf is the go out and be animals just eat and be slaughtered and have no no moral center to you just be an animal out there yeah and that's the enticement of it yeah one other thing i really loved about this movie is again we talked about you know especially in the first half of the 80s we right. had wolfen american werewolf in london oh, wolfen, teen yeah. wolf one and two the howling one two and three Full Moon High all and before, Silver Bullet. All before 84, right? It was 80 to 85, I believe, in, in that realm. <laughs> we were um, obsessed. So we have all those movies, and those are just talking about the popular ones, the ones that were noted at the time. There was yeah. more that I couldn't even get into. So you have a ton of werewolf movies. Everyone seems to be hinging on the fact, can you do a cool transformation? Because yeah. if you can't do that, you're going to sink down. Uh, and I think the, the we get a couple of different one. ones in this film. Yeah, you have this very... It's amazing effect of Stephen Ray's transition. Yeah. It reminded me a bit, I'm sure that, that of the, the film Van Helsing from 2005 or six borrowed from that too, where the idea was you were tearing off your skin to reveal the wolf skin underneath. Um, was a cool idea. And then you also get it too with, I think, uh, Misha Burgese, I think, right. who played the Huntsman, who played our final wolf, um, getting that 
epic shot where he opens the mouth and the thing just shoots out. And of course, right, it looks yeah. a little corny and cheesy, but it's creepy as hell too. <laughs> right. So it's not about, that's the manifestation outside, but it's inside you coming out. Yeah. Um, Eastern cultures have that philosophy that you're you whatever's inside you. We talked about it with Prin Princess Manoke mm -hmm. that you are outside, but inside is your true nature, and that sometimes comes. Yeah, and it, it almost goes even to the level of comparing it to, like, what we talked about with Hellraiser was that skin is flesh and it's terrible. And that's, like, and that's a really disturbing element that I think comes with this, too. The tearing of it off from the guy's face, the, the literally the, the, the excision of it from him was very reminiscent of something that would come a year after this as well with the Nightmare on Elm Street 2, which had that... that Freddy Krueger tearing Coming himself out, out of a guy's right. body. Right. Um, it's really like morbid, disgusting, and I kind of love those elements of it. Um, what else is there? I think the production design is great. <laughs> I think it's a little bit underappreciated mm -hmm. because we have to talk so much about the content of stories, but you're right. They took a great care of production and yeah. art direction. And for the limited yeah. production budget they have, again, having like 12 yeah. trees and like moving everything around to make it look as full as possible. That's hard work. I didn't notice it. Um, but you know, someone who did notice it actually was Stanley Kubrick. Uh, Anton first did the production design for this film, and this was the film that got Anton the job on Full Metal Jacket because Stanley Kubrick loved the production design in this film so much. Two very different production well, designs. Well, he probably <laughs> noticed that he's a perfectionist. Yeah. And then Stanley's a perfectionist, so we work together. Let's see how he does with a bit more money. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, have you seen The Company Wolves? Not The Pack of Wolves. There's intention or reason, but I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, so, join the company down below in telling us your thoughts on the film. And which right. Neil Jordan film should we cover next? I don't think... Have we covered another Neil Jordan film? I don't, I don't think, think so. So, right. so we've no. got a wide berth of options available. Let us know which one we should do next. Uh, we'd love to hear from but you. But overall, Neil Jordan's films are... There's something below the surface that needs to come out. Yeah, and I think that's why he keeps going back to genre stuff, too. Yeah. Is because that's that's an easier avenue to access. The surface is <laughs> deceiving. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So while you're down there, please make sure you like and subscribe to the video. They don't cost you a dime and they really help to support us. It's yes, one of the ways does. you can do it on a free scale. Or like Nick pointed out earlier, check out the Patreon down below to see how you we can We really want you to join the Patreon. Yeah. Yeah. Pick Thank you guys. Price, yeah. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We do appreciate it. Until next time, you can find all my film reviews over at goldfilmreviews.com. Ah, you can find my show, the St. Paul Filmcast, anywhere you find, uh, find podcasts. And yeah, I'm a hairy dude. <laughs>